Hello everyone, this is Kathleen Tirani with Autism Brainstorm, www.autismbrainstorm.org. And this evening we have a segment of Ask the Neurobiologist with Dr. Elisa Woods and Dr. Juan Salinas. Hello and welcome guys. Hi Kathleen. Yeah, they're going to be talking a little bit of science and a little bit of fun stuff. And um, Lisa, how would you like to start? Do you want to go through your slides or just have a little bit of conversation first? I I wanted to do a little neurobiology to start, mm -hmm. um, but you know we were just talking about a lot of different things, so yes. we'll, I'm sure we'll digress. <laughs> I don't. I have some slides, but let's maybe just touch upon them a little bit and then okay. see what happens. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to. One is someone who I've known for, I don't even know, a long time, um, who I actually went to uh, my PhD program, and Juan was a more senior graduate student in my PhD program at <laughs> University of California, Irvine, who mm -hmm. I've always respected. And recently, we kind of collaborated. Um, our lab published a paper, and we found a new protein in the brain, which doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. And I think... I don't know that the protein is involved in autism, but I think there's some intriguing aspects of this protein that would be interest. It would be interesting to look at in autism. I just want to talk about it a little bit, but mm -hmm. not excessively. Um, there's so there's there is evidence that an area of the brain called the cerebellum might be um, not working normally or mm -hmm. con conventionally. I guess you could say in. Uh, in at least some people with autism. And the, so we have the cerebellum here. It's not obviously really pink, but uh, you can see it there mm -hmm. in pink. That was a joke. OK, I'm not as funny as Juan. Juan is, a, is actually also, I should mention, a stand-up comedian in addition to being a PhD neuroscientist, which is, a, I don't think there's anyone else like you, Juan, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, so that the cerebellum might be disconnected. We found a, a protein that's found in the cerebellum uh, it's called tumor differentiation factor, and this just shows a little bit about it, how big it is. It was originally where it was originally found. You could actually move on, I think, okay. from this one. It's a little bit of detail about the protein, and it, we believe it's it's made by a part of the brain, and it, we believe it's a hormone. My son is behind me, actually. Hi. Um, and we think it has some roles maybe in cancer, and that's why our lab started to look at it. But then we decided to verify where it was made in the brain. And it was already believed. So sometimes scientists will, um, to find things, they, they grind up organs. I know maybe that sounds a little weird. But someone had actually uh, ground up a part of the brain called the pituitary and, and had identified this protein there, but they had never really looked at the cells. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to see if it's actually made by this part of the brain called the pituitary, but also to look at the cells. Actually, you could go to the next slide. Uh, we use this technique called immunohistochemistry. This just shows you how it works. There's actually a way that you um, can use tags to identify a protein and you use antibodies to identify a protein and it makes it, I mean, long story short, you get fluorescence and that tells you where the protein is. And this is what it's showing you here. So you get this beautiful fluorescence and we actually did find this protein TDF in the pituitary, in the brain. We also found in the breast and in the, we didn't find in the liver that's actually showing you a control that we didn't actually find it there. So we just move on. So this is a brain protein. This is the first time this protein was ever seen in brain. You want to go to the next slide? Cause I'm, I'm going to try to make this quick. Okay. Um, next slide, actually, because this is a little more detail. And we found it in this area. So this is why I think it might be interesting to autism. We found it in an area of the brain called the cerebellum. So that's the one in the middle there. Uh, top middle. In those cells that are green are called the Purkinje cells. This says PCL. That stands for Purkinje cell. And um, so those cells there are actually, some studies have shown that they're not normal in people with, some people with autism. That's why I think it's kind of intriguing. Um, you want to go to the next slide, actually? Mm -hmm. I was trying to rush through this a little bit. 
Uh, we found that it's made by neurons, the cells of the brain that process information, not astrocytes, and this is just showing you that. So the red is astrocytes and the green is our protein TDF, and you don't see that they match up, so it shows you that astrocytes aren't making it. You just go to the next one. Um, and we did find that it was in neurons. So you see the, where it's yellow, the red and the green match up, they make yellow. And this mm -hmm. just shows you in the brain that our protein is being made by the, those cells in the brain that process information, neurons specifically. But the other reason I think, so I think if you go to the next one, it might show the GABA. Go to the next slide. Not, um, next slide, actually. Now I'm rushing through this a little bit. Yeah. So the other reason I think, huh, well, the formatting's off on this a little bit, but that's okay. Um, we found in, in this experiment here that there is a chemical called GABA that the cells that make GABA actually make this protein. And GABA is another protein that is decreased, found by some studies to be decreased in autism specifically in these cells, the Purkinje cells. So that's why I think this might be an interesting protein, uh, protein to study in autism. So that was my really, really quick synopsis of, of the work we've done. And Juan really gave us feedback mm -hmm. on this study and reviewed the paper. And so I was actually, was kind of, he, he collaborated in some way um, uh, on this. Do you want to say anything else, Juan, about? It's just a, uh, in a, you kind of a, a broader thing is uh, the paper was sent to me by the, the uh, editor of the journal to review, and uh, to give you an idea of some how science works, uh, well, I reviewed it. I thought it was you know very interesting findings. Uh, then after it was all said and done, I sent in my report and everything. Since I knew Lisa, I kind of said I let her know you know that hey, guess what? It's like your paper, and uh, thought it was pretty good. Um, and then talking about it since then. You know, uh, some of the people have criticized the work that it's only describing things and not giving a mechanism how you could, you know, use it for something. And uh, my response within the, the reviewing kind of thing was that, you know, that I, I say, you know, it is, <laughs> but you need to start somewhere. Other kind of uh, brain disorders, you know, you need to know where to look. Mm -hmm. And before you can start figuring out how uh, a protein or, or something may be involved in a, in a disease process, and eventually... So would you say then that this is in the mapping process? This, this would be what the hope would be, is that this is a kind of a marker mm -hmm. for uh, cells that may be at risk. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, for instance, uh, what she didn't talk about, it's kind of like, you know, because off this, off this, it's, it's a brand new protein. It does seem to be similar to some proteins that are expressed uh, called heat shock proteins that uh, are in many different cell types uh, produced when the cell is sort of, you know, under attack and kind of compromised. So uh, if it's doing anything like that, uh, it may be a way to, to look at uh, cells that may be, uh, you know, having to deal with uh, some kind of a stressor that's going on, which maybe has something to do with a, a disorder like autism. So, But it, you can't ever – you need to have a place to start, and this could be uh, mm -hmm. a, a start, and it's the first time I've ever heard of anybody coming up with any potential kind of a marker to map out cells that might be at risk uh, at all in this mm -hmm. disorder. So that's why I said this is worth letting people know, mm -hmm. and it should be published, and then you know other you know labs can uh, look at it and and you know, start working on figuring out what its value might be. Mm -hmm. But if you just don't start, you're never going to get there. So you just got to get started. Yeah, I'd like to look at it in the brains of people with autism, which is a lot harder. I don't know if it, it probably doesn't sound easy, but it's 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 hard to look at human brains at all because. I mean, for obvious reasons, they're just not accessible unless someone has died of some sort of a natural cause or a lot of times people donate their brains, they've been in accidents and that kind of thing. So it's hard to do research in human brains, to look at human brains for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so people often look at animals um, and what they call animal models of, and there are some animal models of autism 
I think it would be interesting to look at this protein in, in those models, specifically in the cells I was showing you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also, I guess I should mention, we have found, so Juan was suggesting that certain types of uh, brain insults might, you know, this protein might be involved in protection from it. And we've actually, we did do an experiment where we found that what's called oxidative stress increases this protein. That's not like directly telling you that it's protecting cells, but it suggests it, that mm -hmm. it might be. And that's something that you also see, it's another theory of autism that there's oxidative stress in, in autism that might be one of the, the causes of some of the, um, the problems in autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's kind of the neuro stuff I, I wanted to show you in terms of what we've been doing. Okay, very good. But we're finished with the slides completely? Let me see. Um, these oh, are just, yeah, well that's knowledge. our, yeah. uh, those are slides left over from the presentation I gave at the I Care for Autism. Uh, it's not okay. bad to show it. This is our lab, uh -huh. a bunch of people in our lab <clears throat> um, doing the work that they do. Mm -hmm. So it's Costel Darie, Isabella Sokolowska. Um, these are a bunch of the um, organizations we work with or that have funded us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are just extra slides. You know, I don't know that there's a lot of value in showing those. That okay. was just, they're sort of left over from the presentation I gave. Um, this is, well, this is how, it's another technique we use. Um, Actually, last time when we were talking about biomarker discovery mm -hmm. in autism, I talked a little bit about mass spectrometry, and you can use it to analyze fluids and find proteins that might be involved in autism. And this is this is pretty much just the machine, mm -hmm. one of the machines that can do that. It's another one of the machines that can do that, <laughs> just to see what you know. This is the actual right. stuff. Yeah, I I don't know if you really need to go through all of okay. these. Okay, okay, we're done. Yeah. Okay. But we were having an, an interesting conversation before, Juan, and, you know, everything we said was kind of offline, um, so you might want, I don't know if you want to talk about it again. Juan, like I s said, he's a neurobiologist. He's Dr. Juan Salinas, but mm -hmm. by day, and then at night he's a comedian. <laughs> and carry he, He's very funny, and I he posted his... Uh, some of the videos showing his, you know, his routine, and I was prepared to be like all polite. No, that's good. <laughs> right. But he's really funny, so I didn't have to. <laughs> it was nice. Yeah, indeed. And one of the things you were discussing was that there, we won't mention him by name, but there is someone uh -huh. in the community, um, the comedy community there where you are, who um, is most probably on the spectrum, or, it, or oh. definitely is. He's on the spectrum. Of okay. But uh, when I first moved here in 1998, that's when I first came across him. And at that point, uh, I, there wasn't that much awareness of adults with autism or Asperger's or anything be on the spectrum. And so uh, initially, people just thought he was odd. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he would stand unusually close sometimes in conversations, uh, and he was very persistent in following. He always had a positive attitude, but it was just, he's a big guy. He's bigger than I am. Mm -hmm. So girls thought he might be stalkerish. Guys thought he was, you know, getting in their face. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time went on, somebody who knew him and his family mm -hmm. said, oh, actually, he, he, he has Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And so then, it's, oh, okay, it's obvious. Now I see, you know, how he, why he's, you know, focused sometimes on certain ideas and subjects and, and likes to have these long, detailed conversations about them. Uh, and whereas, you know, some people have the idea that somebody who might be autistic, uh, may not have emotions or a sense of humor at times because they, mm -hmm. all they know is something like, you know, movies, Rain Man or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they have this kind of distorted image. Uh, mm -hmm. Fred actually has a pretty good sense of humor. He loves it, but because he does have some difficulty in really understanding other people's emotional state sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, He's, his understanding of why his jokes work uh, kind of misses that aspect. And it, it, it's both a little hindrance to his joke telling, but also it's, it's a big savior. Uh -huh. Because 
a lot of comics aren't very good, I'll tell you that much, at least locally, <laughs> the mics. and they'll go up, and then when they don't hear a laugh or the response from the audience they expect, they start to shrivel and wither under the lights. You can just see the flop sweat hitting them. Mm -hmm. uh, but Fred is largely immune to that. So he just comes on, he tells his joke, and he tells his joke, and the next joke, and it's like a comedy force of nature. And though uh, some people in the audience may not be receptive initially to about two, three minutes of this you know, high energy, no quarter given kind of a, a comedy attack, they start mm -hmm. laughing and enjoying themselves. And uh, So does he come across as being very dry rather than anything else? No, he's actually more high energy. He'll, he'll do like oh, a Julia uh -huh. Child impression. Uh, he does an impression sometimes of uh, Ozzy Osbourne singing Crazy Train and getting the, the folks to sing along. Uh, he'll do a version of uh, trying to get the, uh, uh, a call and forth back singing uh, the, uh, the Eyes of Texas or the Stars at Night or Big and Bright. And he'll do all these kind of things. That are, it's sometimes conceptual, but mm -hmm. initially because they're kind of, you know, wacky, uh, the audience may not know what to make of it, but he just... It doesn't matter that it's not hitting Im immediately. It just keeps on, just keeps on with no flagging of confidence over and over. And then people eventually start enjoying it and laughing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, his, his only major problem is when people try to heckle him, uh -huh. uh, he actually actually tries to address them like it's a serious question they're asking him. <laughs> and so he's, he's very polite. So he actually derails the performance. He only has like three, maybe sometimes five or six mm -hmm. minutes. So... That's, I think, the biggest hindrance for him is that he really, by his nature, he's so you know affable and, and likable. Then somebody asks him a question, even on stage, he thinks it's okay, and he tries to respond, you know, honestly. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. oh man, no, Fred, stop that, stop that. But uh, but he's a uh, he's, he's he's been a local mainstay for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned too before we we actually went on air, Lisa, that um, a lot you you think you're seeing a lot more students um, at the university level who are on the spectrum. I think so, mm -hmm. and that's um, as I mentioned to you, Kathleen. That's not based on any kind of data. I guess sure, sure. as a scientist, I'm always like, oh, is there a study that showed that? Well, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's based more on my my instinct, having been in a university setting for quite a uh -huh. while. I mean, mm -hmm. we know, and I know that Juan and I both know that, you know, in terms of accommodative services, mm -hmm. we're much more aware and we do things for people with, with special needs. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, the, the evolution, as schools have evolved at the, the primary level or the high school level, so have colleges in terms of that. So mm -hmm. the special testing situations, even for... Um, even for people with emotional um, difficulties, we're seeing mm -hmm. that that happen. So I, I think, yeah, autism, high-functioning mm -hmm. autism and Asperger's. And it, it, my instinct is not simply that it's being recognized. I think there's more people who are able to attend college who might have had right. challenges before. Not necessarily intellectual challenges, but social. it's more of the social challenges. Yes. Yes. Um, that might that's have kept them. Was, now, that's, mm -hmm. that's all instinct. It's nothing. You know, no, that that's I, what I was I hoping to hear. No, I don't know that that's the case. Yeah, as but an advocate, I sincerely hope that we're making it easier and that we're getting the proper supports into place. Mm -hmm. Because that is that is the aim. Is it, it, because it's not necessarily the cognitive challenges as, right. so much as it is the social supports and the stigma and um, some of the um, oh goodness the, the bullying, mm -hmm. um, you know those types of things. That yeah, the, hopefully are changing. The bullying is an mm -hmm. interesting thing to me because that is, has been something that I associated more with, uh, you know, pre-college level. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're now starting to see it at the college level, which is weird. You know what I'm talking about, Juan? Like this is actually mm -hmm. becoming, and I, I guess, you know, maybe it's just my own naivete. I don't recall this being as big of an issue when I was in college, and now we're starting to see bullying mm -hmm. in college more. I, I don't know. What do you think, Juan, of that? I don't have seen uh, that much, <laughs> at least, so outright bullying. My mm -hmm. context is limited because a lot of my classes are really huge. Like this, oh, okay. Screen I have like. Uh, two sections of over 500 kids. Right. Wow. Wow. Uh, but just listening to people, kids, might like come in and, and, and talk, uh, I would say uh, 
that there are some young people in college that for some people some reason think it's okay to be rude if nothing else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's kind of like you know fun you should take it as a joke even though you can't really tell because there's, there's no context or relationship to be able to say oh you're just razzing me they think actually it's kind of whether it's uh, influence of culture or social media or something I mean uh, back mm -hmm. when I was a kid back when I was a boy <laughs> <laughs> You know, guys who like, you know, were celebrated like uh, the Jackass movies never would have made it. <laughs> it was like that that'd be censored. But now uh, it's sometimes seen in some quarters as kind of cool or hip to be that way. And uh, so I, I can, not in regards to autism, but for other kids, uh, there are a couple in, in my office hours that have, you know, talked to me about uh, some social ostracism when they came out as gay. I'm going like, well, I'm just your psych teacher, but if you want to talk, mm. go ahead and tell me. And so I'll give them personal advice sometimes. And sometimes, though it's not my primary job description, I mm -hmm. do wind up being like a little personal counselor to some of the kids because by my nature, the way I, I lecture, mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty open and friendly. And so I am kind of an authority figure, thanks to the gray beard, I think. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so sometimes they'll come in office hours and they'll be asking something about the material, and then at some point they'll ask me, can I ask you something else? Hmm. And they'll, they'll tell me something about what's hmm. going on in their lives. And hmm. So since I never really had kids, it allows me to vent my kind of paternal instinct you know, towards them and give them a, a shot and say, you know, like the, the, the public service announcements say that it gets better. It gets better. You'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I've always had students self-disclose to me. I think it's a nature of, it, maybe it's my personality, they feel comfortable. Maybe it's also, um, I think the, the, the material that we teach often goes, in neuroscience, I've often been on sort of the border of psychology and biology, and what I teach often goes into psychology. Mm -hmm. It often goes into mental health. I teach a lot about right. mental health. And I, I, um, I also work at a, I've worked at smaller schools probably than, than one, so I, I just because of that logistics, mm -hmm. you know, I have more um, contact, and and I have definitely gotten a lot of input about mm, the bullying. Mm -hmm. uh, big culprit is Facebook. <laughs> 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 Not to insult, of course, you know, don't, mm -hmm. assume, but um, it, it's just it's almost uh, given given access, and and I know with to me the thing with ASD, and this is just my personal observation, nothing else, is um, the lack of social awareness at times leads them to be targets because they won't yes. walk away from the bully. Mm -hmm. so they won't, they don't understand, and, and, you know, obviously I'm not talking about any individual, I'm generalizing, mm -hmm. they may not understand that the bullying is even going on at first, <clears throat> which leads them to stay and remain the target, but also, I guess, you know, it, it's uh, it's enticing for some reason, and mm -hmm. and maybe behaviors in addition are are subject to if they're unusual are subject to bullying. Mm -hmm. That's a very very interesting topic. Yeah. I think that probably we need to have some sort of training and or awareness for sure. high functioning folks. Um, for lack of a better term, who use Facebook quite a bit for their social interactions, who have you know, autism spectrum disorders. I, um, I think universities, mm -hmm. universities need, and probably let's extend that to organizations, universities need strict policies about Facebook use among their students that include the bullying. Mm -hmm. and, and not using the media for that reason. It's, you know, so that that's part of it, I think. Um, the the other thing about the bullying that troubles me as a neurobiologist is all this evidence of the effects that stress has on the brain, and bullying is stress and it is abuse, and people who are bullied are being abused, which leads them to be prone to depression, and Juan, you know the theories about the fact that it even causes changes in your hippocampus and kills neurons due yeah. to high, you know, glucocorticoid yeah. levels and all of that. I mean, wow. we've we've mm -hmm. talked about that for over, gosh, 
a few decades at least. Yes, yeah, 20 years with Sapolsky. Sapolsky, right. First with his, his studies with the, the primate. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, it's... I, and it's not necessarily pertaining to autism in general, but, you know, the students I have in the big classes, even when I have them in, in smaller groups, I try and explain to them that, you know, stress is their enemy, like their fear is their enemy, to try and find ways to relax, whatever it takes. Uh, and the story I'll tell them, you know, well, I'll, at one point I'll, I'll show the connection to the pituitary uh, to the rest of the, the body and the endocrine system. And uh, the story I tell most commonly is, um, I think Lisa may at least be familiar with the person I'm talking about, uh, a guy I did a postdoc with, uh, uh, Norman White, uh, his wife uh, died very quickly uh, because she didn't know she had a congenital liver disorder, and then within a few months she went from just being run down and tired to uh, dying while under uh, anesthesia while they're trying to give her a transplant. Mm -hmm. And that was in a, a May of a given year, and then by July he was in the hospital with what was called idiopathic endocarditis, which means he has an infection or inflammation on the inside lining of his heart, the part that's actually making contact with the blood as it pumps. So how does he get an infection there, I mean, for crying out loud? And so I, I try to then use that as an example to show people that things like a cognitive notion, expectation, an emotion like grief, through the brain, then descending to the pituitary, descending out to this, uh, the adrenal glands, uh, massive release of stress hormones that won't relent. I mean, real stress hormones, uh, naturally, they're supposed to be active for maybe a few minutes, really. Mm -hmm. They'll be dealing with a crisis, but when you have something that's an emotional trigger, a, a concept, or something that's not going to go away, like grief, found right. grief, it gets on and it stays on. And one of the things that it, those stress hormones do is because they're trying to help you deal with a, a what should be a short-term crisis, they turn off or reduce your body's ability to heal, mm -hmm. uh, to motivate its immune system, to to, to marshal that. So. I'm guessing he had such a massive release that uh, something that normally never happens to somebody, he developed an infection on the inside of his heart. Sure. It almost killed him. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea is that, you know, uh, it's, it sounds kind of trivial sometimes. It's like people should just learn to be kind. kind absolutely, of absolutely. Let me ask you this. This is fascinating discussion um, regarding neurobiology and meditation. And or I've heard of laughter therapy. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that just a little bit, as far as the the neurology of that? Anything that relieves stress, I think. Mm -hmm. Also, that is a distractor. That is an activity, in particular, a physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big proponent of walking meditation. I actually have worked at a university here that has, a, it's interesting, it has a labyrinth room. Mm -hmm. la mm -hmm. labyr I don't know if you are familiar with labyrinth, and this is actually for the students for walking meditation. They actually walk a labyrinth. It, I don't want you looking so skeptical. <laughs> no. On the floor. No, um, it makes perfect sense. You should try it. It's, it I, I've actually become a huge proponent of this idea of walking meditation. Mm -hmm. um, as a form of meditation. It, I guess for certain people meditation is wonderful, but other people need uh, something to do. The movement. And it's the movement. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the, the labyrinth has a direction and a goal and then you have to, you go in and you go back out again. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a defined task even. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Essentially, one, yeah, I mean, Sapolsky told us, so this Sapolsky is a, a fairly famous neuroscientist who studied um, primates and stress, so uh, monkeys mm -hmm. and stress, also humans, and <clears throat> really found out a lot of things about it. And I think he's the, one of the first people to propose th this, this whole idea that you know, we had, he, he wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and he talks about the whole idea that stress evolved in situations of fight and flight where animals were escaping a predator or they were mobilizing their energy to fight a predator. So you get to choose. Now that's a short-term 
situation. So what do you do? You don't want to use your energetic reserves or your glucose for things like digestion. You shut that down. You shut down your immune system. That's more of a long-term process. You can shut it down for a while just to use use everything you've got to to uh, fight or fl or flee. Mm -hmm. And and so you shut down your immune system. You shut down a lot of different processes. You increase your heart rate. You increase uh, what's called glucocorticoids, um, which are released from your adrenal gland, you, you increase adrenaline. Short term, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in modern society, think about you know living in a city or being under chronic stress, having a nasty boss, for example, and you've got that kind of process going on chronically now. Or even uh, <clears throat> caregivers, somebody who has a chronically ill child or spouse. Definitely, mm -hmm. yes stress and then you've got the situation it should have been a short-term situation now it's doing things like suppressing your immune system you can't fight off infection uh, it's doing things like actually damaging tissues we found that it probably damages and kills brain cells there's a theory that it kills brain cells in a part of your brain called the hippocampus that processes memory that's not good <laughs> you don't want that um, yeah. So that's that's the kind of thing that that's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. it seems that that a big part of what meditation is is taking you out of the current uh, situation and giving you a larger perspective outside of yourself and your current circumstance, so that you can see the big picture. And I think it, you go ahead. I think it does, but I think meditation, even if if you look at EEGs, creates a situation that's like a lot like uh, I think theta waves during sleep so mm -hmm. it's actually a lot like more ry rhythmic s synchronized brain waves mm -hmm. that might be helpful for memory consolidation or repairing you know I'm just thinking about the neurobiological aspect of it mm -hmm. uh, how, about neuro how about neuroplasticity for uh, yeah I would yeah. speculate that I would yeah take a guess that you'd be more likely to be able to build synapses <laughs> under a condition of meditation mm -hmm. I mean or, or meditating frequently than a right. condition of uh, sitting in a cube farm having your boss yell at you in a <laughs> corporation. <laughs> right, right. Um, going back for just a moment mm. now to um, the university environment. Mm. And um, how, what kind of uh, progress do you think that we've made as far as really valuing learning differences and supporting learning differences? Now, you guys probably, since you are in, in neurobiology, you're probably um, are leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of the other disciplines as far as supporting the, the learning differences of students. But as a whole, how do you think academia is at this, at this time? Have you noticed any changes, any improvements? There's, it's policy now, and that's a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can safely say that. that these, for example, accommodative services are now policy, and when I was at the university, they, they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Juan? Uh, it really varies, I think, by, sometimes by institution. Mm -hmm. uh, the commitment they're going to give to resources. Uh, for instance, the like mm. University of Texas is a really big school, uh, a lot of funding for a lot of things, but I would still today put the, the amount of resources they have uh, to help the students, and some in some areas they're actually probably uh, behind where UC Irvine was when I was there with Lisa. It's almost like a what, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Irvine was a small campus. I mean, they had a separate building where they actually had rooms set aside for kids to take the exams there if they if they needed to. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a smaller campus, they could sort of you know it's e easier to manage. Here is a much bigger campus, but I'm the one. It's, the onus is on me as the professor to find a quiet place, not distracting place for the students in my class to take a, an exam. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. because of that, in a big school like this, um, the uh, the participation or the, the degree of, of, uh, of accommodation that sometimes individual professors give uh, mm -hmm. can vary. I've gotten actually, or since I've been here, too little awards, you know, for you know how accommodating I've been in, in helping these kids, and in part is because uh, my ex-wife, who actually met in grad school, uh, there at UCI, um, she had dyslexia, 
And so she relied on, on the, the student services there, uh, and she kind of got me into tutoring kids uh, mm -hmm. that were there. And uh, the uh, ease with which, as a tutor, I could you know, book rooms to, to uh, do these kids on the side, and I got paid decent, not great, but decent. Uh, and, and even though I was going to volunteer, they actually had the support to encourage this. Uh, so it, it's, like I said, it varies by institution. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as a, as a, well, well, I doubt he's ever going to find out I said this. <laughs> Shh. Shh. Don't there, there he's, he's watching now. <laughs> locally here, this person is a faculty member, okay? He's a faculty member. An unnamed faculty member. An unnamed faculty member. Okay. It's a piece of work. Okay, if I could find him right now, like last night with my birthday, I had a few drinks. If I had to come across him, I'd like... You know who I'm talking to. Because this, 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 this is what this guy has done. <laughs> this, this is somebody who not only has a job here at the university, on the side, he also is on TV and radio locally. Mm. But you're, in, you're on a web show now, on. Yeah, well, okay. Well, he, 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 I had a student who was blind, legally blind, had a seeing eye dog. Mm -hmm. and she told me about this guy giving her a hassle when what she needed is to have him send the exam, basically a Word document, to disabled student services uh, at least you know 48 hours before so they could convert it to Braille so she could take the exam. And mm -hmm. he's recording at her. About doing that, I was like such a big hassle. I'm going, like, dude, you're getting three paychecks, mm -hmm. university, a TV station, a radio station, and it's too much for you to to click send, mm -hmm. send a word document, and you're yeah. it, this girl's blind. She's got a right. dog every single Those, day. Yeah. It's, it's a hard day for her, and three, four times a semester, you've got to buck up and send this thing uh, ahead of time, and I. I got livid. I was going, really? Mm -hmm. He actually, he was curt with you over that? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in a smaller school, I would think, like UCI, uh, Irvine, uh, the overall community from students to faculty is smaller. I think sometimes there's, you know, it's uh, not as easy to be a jerk when the community is smaller. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's much bigger, like the University of Texas, 50,000 students and tens mm -hmm. of thousands of faculty. Uh, you can kind of hide in plain sight being a jerk. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there could be also, I think, state school, ver you know, large state institutions versus smaller private or even smaller state. I, I mean, I've mm -hmm. worked at, at uh, state schools and, and I've worked at uh, private, and the private one I'm working at now, I mean, you couldn't do what you're describing that professor did one at, at this the, where I currently am um, that's sort of the, their climate I think it varies it's probably a, yeah state by state and I've never worked at a really I've never worked at a really large I, university I, though like I, you're just des describing with the University of Texas I really have never worked at, at a place where you have five and I know there's plenty of schools where you have 500 students in a auditorium lecture. Well, I think part of what may have enabled it is that in a really big campus like this, mm -hmm. the students, I think, actually feel a bit more isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel more like this is like, you know, speck on an island, and who's going to listen to me if I right. raise a stink, and where do I even go to raise a stink, you know? Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's easier for somebody who's uh, not fully apprised of their responsibilities as being an agent of the institution to be accommodating uh, if, if mm -hmm. they kind of be a bit of a jerk, uh, the student may not feel as though they're empowered enough to raise a mm -hmm. sting. I think that's one reason why there's a lot of talk these days about transitioning and transition teams mm -hmm. being in place for, for students who are on the spectrum. And um, the, the, the circumstances that you're describing, Juan, make it a, a, a case for, you know, this is exactly why, that we need to have more and more and more of this. Um, I've had students who actually come up to me and say, I think I have a problem. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know I, I get nervous when I take the test or something, and, and then mm -hmm. they're obviously debilitated. 
And I have to, I've, there's a couple of kids I've actually encouraged. And I said, listen, I will I'll reach an accommodation with you, but only if you go to this next building over here, and I want you to go ahead and start submitting your paperwork to, so you can have formal accommodations for the university, not just for this class, but for every other class. Because uh, they, sometimes they do feel like a stigma associated with having to go to disabled students. Sure. I'm not a disabled student. And mm -hmm. you know, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, this whole thing is supposed to be about fairness. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're working at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. What you're getting is not special treatment. You're getting a leveling of the playing field. Mm -hmm. Without this, you're actually working at a disadvantage. The system is geared unfairly against you. And what to you may you feel intimidated because you're asking for special treatment. It's not special treatment. You're, we're just bringing you back onto the same you know, level of a of, of hurdle mm -hmm. that everybody else mm -hmm. has. And these are very basic accommodations. These are physical accommodations that you're talking about. And um, just very, very basic things. What my intention was originally was I was um, wondering about more subtle differences in learning styles. Um, yeah. If it, there are ways that, that, that professors and lecturers um, recently are starting to maybe incorporate different modes that the student population can get the same coursework done. Um, I don't know if I'm making myself clear or not. I, I, have, different an idea. Styles. I mm -hmm. have an idea about that actually and it has to do with online and hybrid courses. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think they're very interesting I know there's different reasons that people take them, and there's different reasons schools offer them. One is distance learning, people who, you know, if you're even in a different state, you could take a course in the university of your choice, mm -hmm. uh, or even in a different country. Uh, the other has to do with they're trying to, it's, there's less overhead for the university, so there's that, and classroom space, mm -hmm. if they don't have enough, they start opening it up online. So there's a, a few reasons for it. I find it interesting, though, in that the educational experience is different. So, let's just to give an example: if you have someone with attentional focus issues, mm -hmm. and they have a a classroom that's recorded, um, even even live classrooms are often recorded so that they can be played back. They mm -hmm. could actually absorb the information. Maybe the the, the information will be presented to them in a way that is more attuned to their learning style. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really intrigued by the idea of, of online and hybrid, not just as oh, distance learning or freeing up classroom space, but as a different educational experience that could be used to accommodate people who lear learn in a different way. Yeah, Absolutely. You can yeah. do unique things mm -hmm. with online learning and and online learning I think a lot of people think oh that means almost like a correspondence course you go to the website and you take the information and you email the professor your your assignments and certainly that is the case for some online learning but there's a lot of other online learning that they have a live it's actually a live classroom mm -hmm. but it's online and I'm, I'm really intrigued by those and the hybrids mm -hmm. also where people for example they might go onto the campus for the, the things that have to be done hands-on or also to get the social interaction where they know the people they're interacting with. So that's the hybrid part. And then they go back and they do an online component. There's a, a few schools offering that. Um, mm -hmm. I, just, I think it's really interesting from the whole perspective of looking at how we're educating people and different unique ways to do it. Definitely, definitely, because I know that, for example, um, I, if, if I'm looking at something, if I'm reading it while you are were, you were lecturing, I will mm -hmm. be much, much better, because it's almost like, mark, 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 this is what I'm hearing, mm -hmm. but if I can visualize the language while I'm listening to the presentation, I know that it will all go in, and I know I'm not alone, um, so there are just many, many ways that people learn. Well, I always um, had a horrible time paying attention in, in mm -hmm. lectures, and mm -hmm. when I was in college, it was take notes. There were no PowerPoint slides. There was no, um, right. oh, can you post a PowerPoint on the website so we can look at it later, which is fabulous, I think. It's a great opportunity. And I, I do it for students because my point is, do they know the material or not? How they get it, I don't care. I want them to learn it. Mm -hmm. You know, and how if they need different ways to learn it, it's great. Uh, but we didn't have that option, and, and it would have been a great option for me because mm -hmm. I don't learn well 
in lectures mm -hmm. at yeah. all. Some people are just not auditory learners, right? I space out and think of other things, and then they've said it, and it's too late. <laughs> and that's always been my problem. Well, I, I, don't know, I guess mm -hmm. maybe I was ahead of the curve, um, mm -hmm. but um, it's a real basic rudimentary website that I have for the, the classes I teach. But I used to have like a, a rough lecture outline. I have like, well, I started it was before there were PowerPoints or, or comments. So I just have these GIF things that I drew in a, a paint program that are my slides. Mm -hmm. that I just surf the class webpage. I have some online text readings. So now the textbook is now uh, basically optional. So the kids don't have to pay like 100 bucks for a, an intro psych textbook, which is, I think I've seen. Uh, and so those are always there so the kids can, you know, download a lecture outline, fill in notes. They have the, the slides there. Now every campus, at least every building on our campus, has like Wi-Fi so they can surf the website along with me. Mm -hmm. And what I do actually as an accommodation for the, the kids' uh, disabled student services uh, is I got a little Zoom video camera because mm -hmm. one of the things you're supposed to do is uh, – get volunteer note takers. There's no funds for paying note takers, so it's volunteer note takers. Uh, but volunteer, even if they're the most motivated, altruistic people out there, you kind of get what you pay for. It's a kid mm -hmm. sick, uh, they're having a crunch in a different class, they skip a class, so there's no notes for the, the, the kids that needs it. Um, and I actually started doing it because I had two students one semester. One was blind, one had cerebral palsy, and the the, the difficulty with motor coordination, they couldn't keep up with the riding speed. So I started actually videotaping my lectures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm in the camera at the at the screen, the computer screen, so as I'm toggling through, and it has a pretty good little microphone, so it, it, it carries my voice pretty well, and I have a lavalier mic as well to tap up the projection. And I would just send the emails to the kids as I get their letters from disabled students go to the directory, send them an email, here's the link, and there's a little special place, you know, a directory kind of hidden from general public view for all the lectures. So that mm -hmm. way they can review it at length, you mm -hmm. know, they scroll through, oh, there's the slide where I you know, couldn't keep up. Stop it there, pause it, play it, replay it as often as they need. Yes, you know, and yes. Listen and watch, look at it one time watching it, then focus on listening. So uh, but that to me... At least from some of my colleagues, there's a lot of newer, younger ones. But when I first got in here uh, in '98, a lot of the older professors—I mean, it's like they were—you would think you have a PhD, you shouldn't be, you know, public about computers. They don't want to do it. But then it's like, no, nah, it's too hard. I want to, and didn't want to hassle with it. Where I thought it was kind of fun to kind of learn some basic HTML and like, oh, look at this, uh -huh. I can make this happen. Ha ha ha! This is neat. So that was just. Uh -huh me enjoying it and making this very basic and rudimentary because in late 98, uh, a lot of kids had really even older computers, laptops, or desktop at home, and so I wanted to make sure it was the fastest loading kind of thing, just simple, basic sort of stuff, and that's why I've kept it, but uh, mm -hmm. basically I kind of knew just from psychology that some people are visual learners, some people are auditory, so hey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can, don't have to try and like memorize what I'm saying while you're trying to diagram out what I've got up there. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can listen to me or just watch it <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and look at the slide without having to, to you know, trying to recreate it, you know, like a Michelangelo on, on, on speed or something. Just, mm -hmm. and pay attention, try and learn what I'm saying and right. have Absolutely. it there. You can come back later if you need to to access again. Mm -hmm. Have a second. Yeah, have had a hangout the other night with one gentleman who's an artist, was a participant, and he was saying that if there's a certain type of music that's playing, that it enables him to be able to take in the information better. Now, you couldn't do that in a classroom setting, but if he has the lecture the way that you're describing and he's doing it at home, he can put his music on, boom, the information gets in. So, Well, that's what I love about the online option. Mm -hmm. I think for... For some people, it's a way for them to learn the material in a way that's more accessible to them. Mm -hmm. For other people, I know there's other people that the online classes are just not good for them, and they right. don't do well in them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's wonderful that we, and like I said, the hybrid also, I, I 
think is a great it's a great option as well. It's just amazing that we have this technology, and yes, it it's exciting to me to see how it'll evolve. Especially when you talk about visual learning, I think about I think about ASD in mm -hmm. particular that we have the option. I, I like to put I, I can put visuals in my lectures, and it's so easy as compared to you know years ago when you couldn't. I mean, you can copy paste images from all over the web, and there's all all. It's so easy to to um, express things visually and mm -hmm. and to have the option what I, I like what Juan said also just to have the option for the verbal learners to have the t the text there but then some visuals for the visual learners mm -hmm. and then for the people who have attentional problems or like to see things more than once you know mm -hmm. to have the slides available to have the recordings available to listen to them again who cares how they learned it if they learn the material that's the point to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when you're talking about hybrid mm -hmm. learning the social aspect as well is, mm -hmm. is, is, is very very nice because if I'm understanding it correctly someone mm -hmm. could opt to at times be physically present and if they're particularly stressed out and they're not in a place where they could socialize well then they could be a distance learner and when yeah. they're ready for more socialization, then they can come back to a physical class. Well, I, I don't, I'm sure there are classes that give you the option of either. I don't know mm -hmm. of the, what, the hybrids I've heard of, it's required, okay, you have to be on One campus for this time and for two weeks and intensive, and then after that we do the online component. Um, but mm -hmm. there, there may be these other options, and I think that's a, a fabulous point you make is that also, if, if you know, let's talk about people with social phobia. For exactly, example. that's exactly. Now what they can about. learn. Like me. <laughs> now they can learn and and yes. take classes, mm -hmm. whereas it would have been very difficult for them. Well, and that they have the experience of the the video, and mm -hmm. the video maybe pans, and you see what the classroom looks like. You take away an awful lot of that anxiety, mm -hmm. and eventually they can gradually participate in person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. It's it's exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to do. I have never done online teaching, um, and I, I'd like to be involved in it to to use the technology to its best advantage. I think it'd be really fun. Um, but like I said, I I, I kind of be, I believe in the live classroom versus the whole the go to a website and download this stuff. I'm just not sure how that's different from correspondence. Like mm -hmm. what we're doing now, you know, the interaction we're doing now, you could have a class like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know when Dr. Stephen Shore, mm -hmm. when he's out of the country, mm -hmm. um, he uses these Google Hangouts to teach classes. And That's um, cool. It's very cool. That's so, cool. So, so the base is yeah. the actual physical class, but he yeah. does do distance teaching too. While, there's, while, while the class is in class, he is, yeah. <clears throat> The disadvantage is we can no longer take off if we go to a conference then. <laughs> They'll be like, just teach it on a Google Hangout. Exactly. Uh-oh. <laughs> From your hotel. Yeah. Yeah, there's a catch. You have no right to miss any lecturing anymore. No, that's really cool. Have you ever thought about, I don't know if, well, if you're teaching huge lectures, Juan, I guess it might not apply. Yeah, you're saying 500 in a lecture hall? Yeah. Wow. Pretty much it. So, wow. Uh, I give a lecture. I actually don't try out jokes on them. <laughs> uh, but if anything, the things that I, I come up with sometimes in the spur of moment to, uh, to uh, explain something, sometimes that's gone back to become a joke. You know, when mm -hmm. I have time to kind of craft it down. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's to me, it's always trying to come up with, you know, a real life example that illustrates uh, the basic principle we're talking about at any given point. And sometimes, you know, they're silly, sometimes they're serious. Like I used the example I just talked about a little while ago with uh, my old postdoc mentor, Norm White, in, in class. And to show them that, you know, uh, while there may be some people who are kind of like quacks who talk about a mind-body connection in some aspects, that there really is real evidence for it, you know, that people do die of a broken heart. Sometimes it's not mm -hmm. just a poetic phrase. There really is a physical mechanism how it could actually work. Yes. And uh, that they're really, uh, it's sometimes silly to try and separate sometimes mind-body issues in a certain mm -hmm. circumstances because it's a two-way street. It really is constantly. You know, your physical activity, you know, really reduces your stress. 
It causes the release of endorphins in your brain, make you feel good, uh, and then vice versa. You know, attitudes can actually change uh, the aspects of your, your physiology. There's a reason some people may hate it, but they say having a pet will help reduce your your uh, say high blood pressure for a lot of people, in part because you're reducing stress. They have some thing or something there that's giving them unconditional love, and they pet it, and they just, and it's something is you know every day almost trivial, but for some people it really helps. It just takes the edge off, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's mm -hmm. well, it's because one way to skin a cat. <laughs> do dopamine is released. <laughs> 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 I, I tell students that if in neurobiology, mind and body are the same, there is no disconnect. Uh, that's that's how I feel. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's hard for me to imagine being a neurobiologist and separating mind and body. Right. Yeah. They're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that we're getting into an age where we're almost? Um, looking at mind, body, spirit, we're looking at subtle energies and intentions and things of that nature and how they work on the on the neurology and on the physiology. Or is that get still a little bit woo-woo for right now? I'm <laughs> trying to... No, go ahead, Juan. <laughs> it's, 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 it's... What? Because I know experiments are being conducted, but I just don't know how recognized they are at this point. It, dep it depends on, on what they're doing. What, what I... Actually, we're getting ready uh, tomorrow <laughs> in mm -hmm. my summer session class to talk about consciousness. Yes. And one of the things I, I tell them is that it's not as easy as you think uh, because the best tools we have can't really see down to a microscopic level in vivo in a living brain as it's occurring. Mm -hmm. What you've got to see is basically... Uh, generalized activity over what is, from a microscopic level, huge areas. Mm -hmm. Even the most finest detail we have is huge areas. And just because you see activity in the brain doesn't mean that your conscious experience has access to it. So for instance, uh, the example I'll, I'll, I'll use at some point tomorrow is there's a, I actually kind of brought it up earlier in, in the summer session, is there's a thing called blind sight. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of known and bandied about in some degree since the late 50s. A guy named Larry Weiskrantz first described it. And it's in people who have damage to the primary visual cortex in their brain. And they are blind. Mm -hmm. But their eyes are intact, their optic nerves intact, some earlier relay centers in the brain are intact. And those earlier relay centers do get information from the visual system. Uh, to help you, you know, say, target your eyes when, when something's moving, uh, to let you know that something's in the periphery corner of your eye to get you to turn. And if you ask those people who are blind, illegally blind, you can try and like punch at them and fake out, but no, they're they're not going to flinch because they cannot see. Mm -hmm. um, if you take like, a flashlight and hold it up in a quadrant of their visual field and ask them, oh. Uh, where am I holding this light? And they think you're cruel because they're blind. Mm -hmm. uh, random chance would be about 25%. One in four shot of guessing the right quadrant. And Weisskrantz was showing individuals doing 80 or 90%. Hmm. But so they can track light. They, they, they could tell what corner of the visual field, and if it was a basic color, mm -hmm. say red or green or yellow, they could tell you the color. But to them, their conscious experience is that it's a hunch, it's a guess. You're forced mm -hmm. to say, guess, guess, guess. So there, it's not perfect, but it's way higher than chance because there's activity in the brain going on that they're not consciously having access to that was in a separate visual system that helps you target and track your eyes. But a lot of times when you're having people doing these imaging studies of somebody in a, say in a PET scan or an fMRI machine trying to see what areas of the brain are, are active during a certain task, uh, depending on the task, you could be seeing activity that is somehow related to what's going on, but it's not necessarily something that they have a conscious experience of. But it somehow allows them to have a conscious experience, but it's not something they can put a, a finger to. Like that's, you know, that's where the purple and the purple cow is. You ask me to think about, you know, that's mm -hmm. where it is. 
The my visual point. system is actually processed. So is that the superior colliculus one? Yeah, pretty much superior colliculus. And actually, for the color part, there is there are some fibers that spin off early on that go to higher order areas. I think V4 or V5. Because the, col the, the color processing is so intense that you it, it gives some of these areas a heads up. You know, uh -huh. we're working on this a little bit, and the rest of the information will come <clears throat> catch up to you later. Uh, so you can do because it's if to use computer jargon, your visual experience it's a hell of a lot of bandwidth in real time. Hmm. So there's the primary visual cortex, which does a lot of the bulk work of decoding what's going on in the world and some aspects of color and motion, there are these other areas that eventually that big bulk information catches up with, as well as these separate areas that are involved in just targeting your eyes and helping you keep things in your field of view. And so these other areas, uh, you don't have a conscious experience when they're getting their information, but they're still there. And so these people with blind sight, if you ask them, it's to them, it's a, it's a guess, but at some level, you know, processing it. Processing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. and so there's activity going on in the brain. If you'd see the, if you were in a normal person, giving them some kind of visual task, those areas would light up, but you wouldn't necessarily be right in saying that those areas are part of the conscious experience of <sighs> the, uh, the activity. So that's something that's always any kind of uh, imaging techniques that have been used in the mm -hmm. past in the brain, uh, they're kind of related. So things like PET scan, things like uh, 2D geo radiography, and things like that, that uh, there always has been a, a debate. Like my old graduate student uh, mentor, Dr. McGaw, Jim McGaw, would always ask that of people who are doing imaging studies, that what are you actually measuring with that activity? What does that activity really tell you? And a lot of it is kind of up in the air. We're not entirely sure, in some cases, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it so intriguing and interesting, and it's like the diffusion tensor imaging that you showed, Kathleen, on mm -hmm. Facebook the other day, and it's, it, it, but it's true. I think it, it doesn't, the imaging still doesn't have resolution mm -hmm. to show it. Certainly not at the, the single cell level, that's clear, but even in terms of regions, it, it's often quite sketchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just about out of time. Let me ask you, I can't help myself though. In terms of placebo effect, um, my understanding is that when prayer is done, folks tend to heal more quickly. Lots of studies have shown this. Um, what is the mechanism through which this happens? Prayer. Prayer, prayer, and by, or by other people, by, or by by the by the understanding that other people are praying for someone. I, the I strength would, of the person's belief, their own belief. Can I speak to the placebo effect? Sure. I don't underestimate the power of the placebo effect. Is is massive. If you look mm -hmm. at any uh, psychiatric medication clinical trial, there's a huge placebo effect frequently, mm -hmm. and that. That's that's a huge thing not to be underestimated, which doesn't sure. mean that other, other things don't work. It's just that you have to subtract that out then. Um, so I don't even know if I'd call prayer a placebo effect, but I guess if, if you're sick and someone is praying for you, I would imagine there's the knowledge. You have mm -hmm. a good social support network, which is huge, mm -hmm. huge. Um, in terms of the neurobiology, I would go back to the whole stress hormone and reduction thereof, hypothesis increasing, mm -hmm. things like endorphins, dopamine, which is part of our reward system, <laughs> um, you know, and decreasing things like cortisol and adrenaline. Uh -huh. Many studies that you guys I'm very remember. mechanistic. Right, right, of course. Now, I, I would say that, you know, I don't care where the effect comes from, Take it if you can get it. Work. <laughs> <laughs> Take it if you can get it. Yeah. Uh, where you know things that are metaphysical. You know, you know. Uh -huh. we talk about in class with with uh, students at one point. We're talking about research methodology. I I say that uh, you can't discount mystical explanations necessarily 
uh, because with science because it's there you're, you're trying to like you know uh, flip an omelet with a pipe wrench. It's sure, of course. Of great course. kinds of tools, and for right. science to work, you need repeatable uh, objective observations, and mm -hmm. some you might call mystical experiences are kind of unique one in a once in a lifetime kind of things that you can't put under a microscope. So maybe mm -hmm. they work, maybe they don't. You know, but you can't really put them in uh, a basket and put them on a scale and weigh them. So right. maybe they, work, they don't. If it's just the fact that uh, somebody believes somebody's praying for them mm -hmm. and uh, they're praying themselves and they have some other reasons to, to have faith, if mm -hmm. that's enough to reduce their stress in a mechanistic way, mm -hmm. uh, unleash the body's ability to heal itself, to immune system repair things, uh, then it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it's, it, it'll... It, it, right. The it, human body in and of itself is an absolutely miraculous thing. That we're sitting here talking to one another is absolutely miraculous. And, and so I, I say, you know, if, if it works for somebody, mm -hmm. fine. I'm not going to poo-poo them. Go for no. it. You know, if, if it gives you relief, uh, mm -hmm. fine. My, my blessing. Do it. Mm -hmm. uh, just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Make be careful who you, who you listen to. Sometimes people uh, do pray in a P R E Y mm -hmm. on people who. Uh, Unfortunately, have, that's true. Yes. Who, yes. You know, they're in dire straits. Yeah. And so you have to. It's like Lisa was saying, if you know people are praying for you, that means you have a social support system, people there for you, mm -hmm. and they can bring comfort, and they can, and it could, you know, there's the old story is uh, that's like when I was a kid, Bennett Surf. Who was diagnosed with you know cancer, and supposedly allegedly he just locked himself in a hotel room. I think it was in the, in the plaza in New York, with all these joke books. Absolutely yes, yes. And you know yes. he thought, well, I'm gonna die. Might as mm -hmm. well you know die laughing. And then by the time he's done, he goes to the doctor and you're fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and he swore by it. He wasn't making it up. And mm -hmm. so, and anything. For instance, for me with stand-up comedy. To me, it was just a way of relieving stress, keeping myself from going nuts. Mm -hmm. and it's fun to sometimes come up with a joke, and fun to sometimes tell it. Mm -hmm. And so, if it wasn't that. Who knows? Maybe I had a heart attack, <laughs> stress. You know, but and that, yeah, that connection with other people as well. My release. It's my mm -hmm. release. Mm -hmm. Jokes are so often based on really tragic and horrible things, and then they're, for some bizarre reason, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. I guess it's a way of. A coping? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Okay, well, we've been talking for about an hour. Thank you so much, you guys, for your time. Do you have anything else Thank that you. you would like to share at this point before we wrap it up? You're good? I'm fine. <laughs> no, this was fun. Thank you, Kathleen. And, thank uh, you, guys. Thanks, Juan. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be back um, maybe in another month or so. Sure. And uh, talk a little bit more of uh, interesting uh, neurobi neurobiology stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing. Thank you, everyone, for watching and for Autism Brainstorm. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Is it?